Good afternoon from Belgium and welcome to uh, a short seminar on modeling extremes uh, by me, David Vos. Um, I'm director of Vos Software. Um, I've seen that uh, there's quite a lot of attendance um, from a variety of different fields, which is very nice to see, um, because this is an area that applies in many different fields. So, modeling extremes. Uh, we need in life to plan for extreme events. Uh, for example, the coldest and hottest days um, for electricity demand, emergency services, um, disruption, farming, etc. Um, we've got an extreme event going on right now in New York. Some of our uh, users in New York, uh, we're recording this webinar for them because probably they have no internet access right now. Uh, the heaviest rain and the highest winds, um, which obviously is the topic of concern for them. Um, you need to know this for because of wastewater infrastructure, uh, how, much, how big your pipes need to be, how big your reservoirs need to be in order to cope with heaviest rains, um, how strong a building or a bridge an oil rig needs to be to uh, withstand the highest winds, etc. The biggest cracks and the greatest traffic flows. Uh, for If you've got large cracks appearing in a pipeline, you want to know what could that largest crack be physio and uh, that relates to how frequently you're going to uh, inspect your pipelines or replace them. The heaviest person, I didn't want to do a picture of the heaviest person so I did a fluffy cat instead, uh, the heaviest person and the biggest outbreaks. Um, for healthcare provision we need to know, uh, like if you, do you need to helicopter people out, how big um, does your bed need to be in a hospital to be able to cope with um, ever-increasing population size, not just in numbers, but in actual size of people. Um, how, what va vaccine stocks do you need to be able to cope with the largest outbreak that you might come across? Uh, we need to plan for the greatest pollution uh, events that might occur, or smog, um, for things like insurance and the ability to clean up what, how many trucks and how much chemical uh, do you need to keep in storage to be able to handle spillages? Uh, what your environmental policy should be to cover the peaks of smog effects? Uh, the largest uh, disasters, on, you've got a picture on the left-hand side, this is the Halifax disaster in Canada. Um, this was a, sh two ships collided, one was French and one was Norwegian. And they collided in a port and one was absolutely full, the French ship, uh, whose fault it was, by the way. Uh, the French ship uh, was full of ammunition and it absolutely blew the town to pieces. It was until uh, the atomic bomb, the biggest explosion ever, it even caused its own tsunami. And uh, the, the greatest fraud, and here we have a picture of uh, Bernie Madoff. And many more. So we have um, refuse in concentrations. We have here we have a uh, an oil rig that sank, the largest oil rig ever to sink, the Dow Jones, Dow Jones shedding 778 points off its stock. Crowd control, how big do you need your uh, police force to be in order to be able to manage your crowd control? The biggest wave that you might come across on an oil rig or um, for um, protection of the coastline, etc., etc. So in many, many different areas, we try to understand extremes. I guess the first question we really have to ask ourselves is what does the biggest mean? That's, we can apply the same question to the smallest, but mostly it's the biggest um, in terms of extreme. Well, we have to apply some sort of practical limit. Uh, normally, uh, a time frame, like the largest earthquake that might occur in the next hundred years, or the largest outbreak, or the largest wave, or the largest gust of wind. Mm. Um, have to have some sort of a limit of exposure. Um, it could be uh, of a thousand insurance policies that an insurance company uh, supports. What will the largest claim be? The exposure will be a thousand policy years, for example. And it's a probability distribution. It rarely has an absolute maximum value. Uh, essentially, you can think of these values as going off to infinity. Very often, the risk events that we are dealing with, they occur randomly. You don't have uh, waves that occur very regularly. You don't have wind gusts or earthquakes or, or outbreaks or uh, 
pollution events. These are all random events that occur in time. So there isn't essentially any limit on the number of events that might occur. Uh, and so we often we're asking ourselves a rather complicated question of what is the size of the largest of an unknown number of events where we don't even really know the distribution of the size of one individual event. So we're talking about distributions inside distributions here. And we might not just be interested in the largest event. So uh, a bank, maybe, it can, uh, it can cope with the, the largest loss on a transaction. But how about the second and third largest? Well, on its own, it might be able to cope with one. But if you're looking at the second and third as well, it has to ha cope with all of those three in, in the same period. This might be more than it, it's uh, able to deal with. So you can apply the same thing to uh, smallest as well. For example, volume of sales, uh, the amount of rain, the smallest amount of rain creates a drought, etc. Well, the classical approach, uh, something you may have heard of, uh, is using extreme value theory. And there are some distributions uh, that are well known, extreme value distributions, and you'll find most of them in our own software model risk. There's the Gumbel, the Freshe, the Reverse, the Weibull distribution. These are all uh, examples of something called the generalized extreme value, or GEV, distribution. Now, this seems to be something uh, of, uh, that could be rather useful, right? generalized extreme value. But it's a mathematical uh, tool, really. It's based on the principle that you have some underlying variable, say the, the size of a an insurance claim. Uh, then mathematically, as the number of insurance claims approaches infinity, so the size of the largest claim will approach an extreme value distribution. Unfortunately, extreme value distributions are very difficult to fit because what they really represent is the largest. And that means that, for example, if you had 20 years of data and you were looking at the largest for each year, you only have one value for each of those years that you would fit your for your, your distribution to. But we have a lot more information than that. And so um, we're really losing a lot of information by using extreme value distributions. We also, because this is an asymptotic uh, distribution, meaning essentially that this is the distribution you would have if we had an infinite number of events, then we can't really link that distribution to the absolute number of events that we might have. If I had uh, 50 large claims next year, what would be the largest of those 50? Well, the extreme value distributions will not tell us that, they, because they're assuming that you have an essentially infinite number. So it, are these extreme value distributions useful? No, not very. Uh, it's pretty limited, and it's mostly of mathematical interest. You'll see them in textbooks on mathematics, but it's a limited value. The reality that most of us live in is that we have uh, a number of events following some probability distribution here. And we have the size of an individual event. And then we're asking ourselves, which will be the largest out of all of these events that might occur? So it could be, for example, that we had 28 events. And each one of them follows this distribution. And so what would the largest be? Will it be somewhere, sitting somewhere in the tail of this distribution of the size of an event? And we can create a very simple model for this. Now, the simple model essentially goes this way. We randomly select uh, a sample for the number of distributions, so for example, 30. Then we take 30 samples from this distribution here, the size of an event. We calculate the maximum of these 30 samples, and we're done. There's one scenario of what the maximum might be. And then we repeat these, this cycle one to three. So a simple model. Here's a simple model we can see. I've got a number of events. In this case, the number of events is, you can see in this formula, following a Poisson distribution. Click on View Function. You can see that Poisson distribution. Here we have a, a log normal distribution, 
of the side of an individual event. Now you'll notice that um, what I've done in Model Risk here is I've written log normal object and I'm simply sampling, both simulate and sampling from this log normal object and this whole array I've got here, a um, hundred different uh, possible samples. It's an array function so it goes very simple, very quickly rather. Uh, it's sampling from that log normal distribution. And in this cell here, I'm calculating the maximum of all of the values up until that point. So if we had, say, four events, then we would have the maximum of those four events is 27. If I hit the F9 key, you'll see these numbers change in the screen. And all I've done here to calculate the maximum is a little offset function, which is pick, reading up that value 23, finding the 23rd um, row along here, and reading the number into this cell. So you can run a simulation and you see the distribution. And that's, that's very nice, it's very simple. But the model like this becomes rather impractical when the number of events is very large. So for example, uh, if we have 25,000 on average, you might have 25,000 events instead of 10 or 20 or 30. Then you can imagine building a spreadsheet with 25,000 cells, more even up to 26,000 cells. That's going to take uh, a lot of uh, time to run the model. And you know, if this can be not 25,000, it could be 25 million as well. Well, in situations like this, we really need a different approach. The model uh, uh, becomes very slow at best, um, and, and perhaps impossible within a spreadsheet. Well, within model risk, we have the ability to do this. Here I've got pretty much the same scenario, but instead of a Poisson distribution with 25 or 30 here, I've got 25,000. I've got the same log normal distribution. But what I'm doing here is in this cell, one single cell, I'm writing uh, those largest. Let me view function on that. And you can see how this works. Here is a log normal distribution. I'm asking, in this case, 25,171 samples from that log normal distribution. And here it's giving me the distribution of what the maximum of those 25,000 might be. You can see it's somewhere between 100 and 150, which is way out on the right-hand tail of this distribution. So the vote's largest function enables us to immediately uh, look at the maximum value that might occur. Now, you might think that this would take a long time, but it turns out it doesn't. So let me run a sim simulation on this cell. Now it's 1,000 samples. It was extremely fast. It's essentially a model built out of three cells. One, two, three. And we can change the numbers here from 25,000 to, say, 250,000, and it will make no difference at all. Now, you might not be just interested in the maximum. You could be interested in, say, the, the largest 10 values. Um, so you remember, I made the point a little bit earlier that if you've got uh, a limited amount of resources, you, could, you might be able to handle the largest uh, event that might occur, the largest outbreak. But how about if there were two or three outbreaks in that same year? Or how, how there were two or three major shocks to the, the market in the same year? Could you handle all of them together? So here we have uh, a model that gives me the 10 largest samples. And this is using the function both largest set. Here you see, in this case, in this scenario, I've got 25,000 um, samples being uh, taken, 25,000 events. And I'm looking at the 10 largest of those events, and you'll see what they look like. And there, there is a distribution of all of those 10. They sort of overlap each other, but one must be larger than the next, larger than the next, larger than the next, etc. even though the distributions overlap. So, the those largest set function, and we have the same thing for those smaller set, allows you to model um, a whole group of, uh, of extremes in one go. Please note that you cannot apply the same function or 
these two different functions at the same time. So this one is simulating entirely independently of these others. If you wanted the, the largest, you want the kth largest, um, say the fifth largest, and the maximum and the, and the top 10, well, this is the only function you would want. And you would pick up this one for the fifth largest, this one for the largest, etc. But you, they are running independently. So you cannot look at uh, this value and at this value at the same time. You can see they're different. We also have a function that looks at the kth largest. So, um, for example, in insurance companies, sometimes they will co-insure, and one company will uh, take the maximum claim, and it will pass off the second largest claim to another company, or the third largest, etc. In that case, you might be interested, if you're a company, insurance company, taking the fifth largest of a set of claims, you might be interested to know what that one is. And here we have uh, both kth largest, where you have the same idea, how many might occur, the distribution size, and um, number five for the fifth largest. <laughs> well, how can we apply these sorts of things in a model? Um, here's an example model. We've got um, an oil rig, where it's got uh, 12,582 links in chains that anchor the oil rig to the ocean floor. And here we have the strength of, uh, oh sorry, we have the number of wind gusts that might, might occur. And here we have two distributions. Uh, here is the strength of an individual link, and here is the stress of an individual gust. Now, if any one of these, perhaps 209, 220, whatever, different wind gusts, if any one of those is larger than the weakest of those 12,582 links, then the chain will break. So it's a very interesting problem to try and look at what the probability is of that chain breaking. And here's a little example model to do that. We have the strength of a link, which is following a log normal distribution here, the stress of a wind gust following a different log normal distribution, the ones that are graphed. Here we have the number of links in a chain. Here we have the number of gusts in a year, which is following something that look, look, looks a bit like a Poisson distribution. It's a polyad distribution. Here we have the size of the weakest, uh, of the strength, of the weakest link. So in this case, I've used those smallest. I want the smallest of 12,582, um, each of which may follow this log normal distribution. And here I'm looking at the largest. I want the largest uh, gust stress um, out of, in this case, 97, but it could be more, 117, 121. This is a sample from the polya, where each one of them follows a log normal distribution. Now, clearly, um, when does this fail? It fails if If this maximum gust stress is greater than the weakest link, then you one means it's failed, a zero means it didn't fail. And if I take uh, the mean of these zeros and ones, that's equivalent of the fraction of times that this, uh, that this chain has failed. So I run a simulation. And here we have the answer, 4.16%. Of course, I run it before. All right. So, uh, and I don't need to make this an output, by the way, because it's those sim mean, um, which is taking the mean of this cell here. So, out of my 10,000 samples, 4.16% of them came up with a flag of 1, which meant that we had a gust stress, but that was greater than the weakest link strength. So here is a typical example of when you're comparing maximum and minimum. Um, you can have, you can imagine the idea where you, you're building uh, structures and you want them to withstand some wind or you want them to withstand some rain, etc., etc. Um, then this sort of model is extremely useful.
Now, where do we get these distributions from? Uh, well, normally, we are going to fit them to data. So uh, we have distributions of the number of events that might occur. These could be fixed, uh, for example, the links in the chain. But usually, they're random, and usually random in time, in which case the Poisson distribution, the Polya, and the Delaporte, and there are several others with the model risk that apply. These are distributions of the frequency with which events may occur, given that they occur somewhat randomly in time. They could also be related to a number of trials. So for example, um, if you had 100 attempts at um, a drilling for oil, um, you've only got a, a maximum number of 100 where you m might get a success, and you were looking at the size of the, of the biggest uh, oil reserve that you might hit, for example. The size of the event um, that you're going to model, we need to extrapolate that from the observations we have in our data set. Now, very often, when you fit a distribution to the size of the number of events, you're going to have uh, uh, a reasonable fit in the body of the data set you've got. But what you're really interested in when it comes to extremes is a very good fit in the tails of the distribution. And sometimes it's important to be able to splice a distribution, which I'm going to show you here, or fit a spliced distribution to your data set. You should also maybe consider whether actually there is an upper bound to your distribution. So the size of event, how many people could uh, die in an outbreak? Well, so probably not more than the number of people in your country, for example. So if it looks like that distribution that you're fitting to your data has any probability of extending beyond the size of your country, you know that you really need to bound it. So let's look at a banking example. Here we've got um, a number of frauds per year. And here we have uh, some 20 years worth of data on the number of frauds that we had each year. And here is a distribution or the data set of the number of, uh, or the, the cost of each fraud as it occurred. So I've got 300 and something uh, different values there. What I've done on the left-hand side is I fitted the Poisson distribution to uh, my, my data on the number of frauds. And I've also done the same thing with the polya. And these are fit objects, you can see, the Delaporte. And then I've used a, a function in model risk called those best fit object. This is selecting from these three distributions, all fit to the data, and it's finding the best fitting out of those three distributions, which in this case happens to be the polyo. Um, how does it do it? Well, it compares using um, whichever information criteria you choose. These are the uh, methods we use to fit uh, distributions or rank the goodness of fitted distributions. One is the Akaiki information criteria, which is the most common, but that's not really so important. The important thing is it's found this function is finding which of those three candidate distributions, all of which I think are reasonable uh, uh, distributions to describe frequencies, is finding the best fitting out of those three. And then over here, uh, I fit a spliced distribution using a log normal distribution for the, the majority of my data and a Pareto distribution for the tail. Let me show you that. So here is a histogram of the data. And here you see in red, you've a log normal distribution fitted to the majority of the data. And then there is a splice point here, at a value of 7, where in the tails of the distribution, I fitted a Pareto. Uh, why would I select a Pareto? It's very commonly used for fitting tails because it has the longest tail of any distribution that, um, that is out there. That seems rather a strange idea the longest tail, because if a distribution goes to infinity, it can't really have any longer tail than that. But what we mean by that is that the probability density, if you like, it decreases in the slowest possible fashion towards zero. And you really can't get a distribution that has a longer tail than the Preto. So if anything, we are possibly being a little bit conservative in applying a Preto distribution to the tail here. We, we know that theory, it shouldn't be worse than that. So, 
I've fitted a splice distribution to my data. And just uh, to, for illustration purposes, let me show you here in this graph what happens when you compare in black the actual data in cumulative form. In red, I've got the log normal distribution. If I hadn't bothered to splice a log normal together with a, a Pareto, I just use a straightforward log normal distribution. You can see that it doesn't have so much probability in the tails. It's closer to 100% probability, the log normal. Whereas the spliced distribution has a longer tail. So that spliced distribution is giving more probability weighting into the extreme. And then I simply apply exactly the same idea as we had before. So I'm looking for the largest um, out of a, a polyer distributed number of events that will occur, frauds, where the size of the, uh, the um, individual fraud is following a splice distribution. So because I need, uh, in this cell, I need an actual number, I'm ha having to use a simulate function to simulate from that polyer distribution. All right. So we can run a simulation from that, but it's exactly the same idea. So do it quickly. See, here you see the distribution of the largest loss. Okay, I have time for just one more model. <coughs> um, and this is a little seminar to give you an idea of some of the, the analyses that you can do to try to understand extremes and to help you be able to, um, to manage them uh, and build your strategies around extreme values. So uh, sometimes uh, we have the situation where more than one extreme is of importance and they are somehow related to each other. So for example, if I go back to the oil rig, um, we have uh, wave height and wind speed when you're sitting on an offshore rig, well, you can imagine these are correlated together in some way. The, the higher the waves and the higher the wind speed and well, vice versa. So if we didn't correlate the extremes, then we would, in simulation modeling, we have the situation where we don't get uh, the highest extreme uh, wind at the same time as the highest extreme wave. And we kind of need to have that uh, working right because they're both applying stresses onto that, that structure. Well, you can actually correlate uh, extreme values in model risk. Uh, you can't use it for the largest set or smallest set because these are a set of random variables, not an individual result. But you can do it for the smallest, the largest, the case smallest, case largest. Um, and I'll show you how we do it. So here I have um, some data. Uh, I've got a daily observations of the maximum wave height and for our um, American friends I've used feet and uh, I've used miles per hour for the maximum 10 minute, minute uh, wind speed. Uh, for those of us in Europe we would use uh, meters and kilometers per hour. Perhaps. So I've got these distributions um, or these data sets for observations, these are daily observations and I've ranked them um, from top to bottom in, in terms of the, the wave height. Uh, I plotted the two together. So you can see here, uh, these are plotted. Um, the red values are the highest, the ones that I've got highlighted in green here. These are the red values. Um, they're kind of the, the biggest set that are occurring at the same time. The blue are the rest of the rest of the data. And what I've done uh, is I've fitted here a log normal distribution to my individual uh, wave heights and another log normal distribution to my individual uh, wind speeds. I choose a log normal distribution just so there's no argument, but it could be something quite different. And I fitted a copula structure to the maximum um, wave heights. So we've got the, the top values that we've observed. So these values in green, I fit a copula distribution, a copula uh, correlation structure to that. So I can view function and you can see here are my data in red, and here is the copula in blue and the combination of the two. You can see them kind of nicely match. Notice that this, the correlation is much stronger when both are taking their highest values and weaker 
at the lower end. So how am I putting my model together? Well, over here, I've got uh, Poisson, Poly, and Delaporte. Again, three distributions fit. The Poly is found to be the best fitting of all of these. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong model. <laughs> Didn't quit this model. Back, back where I am. OK. So uh, we've got um, log normal distributions uh, fitted to my data set. We've got a correlation structure put in here. And what I've done here is I've uh, taken the largest of, you can see from the formula, 365, because these are daily observations. I want to know in a year what the largest uh, combined wave height and wind speed might be. So I want to sample the biggest out of 365 values drawn from this log normal distribution. And, and the same thing over here. Um, I want the largest of 365 drawn from the um, wind speed. Now these are uncorrelated, but over here in the, sec in the second row, I'm using a correlation. So the U parameter, of those of you who are familiar with model risk, um, I am correlating the largest uh, value distributions. So here I'm using these correlation structures in the largest um, for the wave height and for the wind speed. And let's just run a simulation and see what it looks like. I'll do 10,000 samples. You'll see this runs very fast. And let's look at the results. So here is a result of the uncorrelated wave and winds. Um, in, this is the correlation structure in terms of percentiles. You can also look at it in terms of values. So you have very uncorrelated. There's, there's nothing to suggest the pattern that we actually observed. If you remember here, the pattern we observed in, uh, in the original data. You can see that. We've got that correlation structure. Well, because we're, we're not modeling any correlation at all, there is absolutely no pattern observed there. But then from here, when I, I'm looking at the correlated wind and wave, you see that correlation pattern is being replicated. And here we see the values in terms of uh, the actual correlation structure and percentiles. But if I show it in terms of values, you'll see that you get the same thing. You get that strong correlation um, behavior. So some very powerful techniques, I hope. Uh, um, you can use uh, some of the modernist features to build some extremely simple and yet very powerful model. Uh, I hope you find it useful. I'll stop giving my talk now. Uh, so uh, you uh, are aware we're going to send you by email, for those of you registered, um, a copy of the models I've done, the PowerPoint slides, and we'll probably put this uh, recording on our website. So we'll give you a link to that so you can also watch it again. And that gives you a chance to play around with the models. And of course, you can ask me any questions. Uh, send me an email, david at um, You can call our office. Uh, please use Belgian time. Uh, all right, so I'll stop talking now. If anybody's got any questions, then I'll happily uh, try to answer any of them. OK, I have a question about um, correlation structures. What are the benefits of copulas um, compared with other methods? Um, well. Uh, we have, first of all, there is another webinar that we're doing in a week or so on correlation structures. So uh, that will probably answer your question then. But uh, the short answer is other methods by which I think you mean things like rank correlation. Uh, these are actual sp special examples of correlation structures, um, of, of copular correlation structures. Um, what's different, if you like, and we're, we're a little bit explicit with model risk about naming the correlation structure. Um, in, we have correlation structures of, of a variety of different shapes. So uh, other software products, for example, only have the ability to do this. This is the normal copula. This is the correlation structure talked of or used by all of the other software products I'm aware of. Um, it has this elliptical correlation structure, which means that it equally correlates with the same strength 
at the maxima of two variables or more as it does at the minima of two variables or more. But that often isn't reality. Uh, so there are other correlation structures, like, for example, the copula, uh, the, the Clayton copula. In this case, it uh, has much higher correlation when those variables are towards their minimum. But you can also have it when one variable is at its minimum, the other variable is at its maximum, or um, one variable is at maximum, the other one is at its minimum, or um, they're both at their maximum. Uh, we have uh, the Frank copula is kind of a, a sausage copula. So here the sausage is, is negatively correlated, here it's positively correlated, and it has a sort of even level of correlation um, across the whole range. Uh, there is the gumball, which has more correlation at one end than it does at the other, but it, it's kind of halfway between the normal and uh, and uh, Clayton. And then we have uh, something that's used quite a lot in finance, a slightly bizarre um, correlation structure known as the T or student popular, which correlates more in the corners, in the four corners, that has this tendency to have a sort of normal shape. Uh, so if I uh, was to make this um, yeah make this 20 30 30 make this 0.9 then you will see this is a correlation structure that is almost exactly the same as normal copula so the, so the idea of using a copula is you have a variety of different correlation structures it's very interesting that most people focus on distribution but they pay almost no attention to correlation structures. Perhaps because it's slightly more difficult to, to visualize or to understand, but it's, uh, it's perhaps the most important uh, component of your risk modeling, risk modeling after you've uh, uh, selected the distributions to start looking at uh, really correctly modeling correlation structures. Okay, so uh, another question was, in my first examples, uh, I identified the maximum events. Um, the question is, what's the probability that they will occur? Well, um, okay, let me just give you a, a simple example. So here's the maximum. Uh, if you remember, we had the uh, number of events was plus on 25,000. Here's a distribution of the size of one individual event. And we want to know what the maximum of those events might be. If I run a simulation on this, to run it. So I'm producing 10,000 samples. Then I get this distribution. If your question is, well, what is the uh, maximum uh, size I might get? Well, it's a, the answer is a distribution. Um, if here the 90th percentile is, has a value of 149.06, the 10th percentile of 110.28, so it takes a range. There is, in theory, this will go off to infinity, so that's why in practical terms we have to start talking about um, what we mean by uh, a maximum. So then perhaps we want to talk about the 95th percentile or something like that, um, so we can, we can uh, edit the sliders here. We can put in the 95th percentile example. And so here, the 95th percentile is 159. So we're 95% sure that the, the maximum cannot be bigger than 159. So if you wanted to be 99.9% .9 sure that your building will, uh, will not fall down due to uh, a tornado strength, then you would put in the value of 99.9% .9 find the value of this uh, here and make sure that the tolerance of your building um, exceeds that particular uh, value. Okay, so I think that's all the questions uh, I've had this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Um, please feel free to send me feedback um, personally or send me some questions if you've got any to my, uh, to my email address. Um, just to remind you, my email address is david at vosoftware.com. Thank you for your attention.